Well, good afternoon. I'm very happy to be with you. I discovered uh, some years ago when I was speaking to a group of about 300 North Americans, people from the United States, that speaking about fundamentalism can be very risky. I went up to the podium and my opening comment was, fundamentalism is fundamentally wrong. It is an aberration. And a hundred people stood up and walked out. <laughs> and then I said, and everyone was going, oh my. And the lady who invited me to give the talk, I looked over at her and she was beet red and her, her hands were shaking. And I said, okay, but that is the problem. Somehow we have to learn to talk to each other. And it doesn't do any good if we stand up and run out of the room. Well, anyway. So I'm happy to be here with you. Happy nobody has stood up to walk out. What I'd like to do is uh, talk a bit about, well, let me tell you. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, make a few comments about fundamentalism in general in my introduction. Then I'd like to uh, share some thoughts with you about the evolution of fundamentalism in the United States. Then uh, some reflections about common features of all fundamentalisms. And then, right at the end, what do we do about fundamentalism? In 19, in, yes, in 1980, the greatly respected American historian George Marsden published Fundamentalism and American Culture. It was a history of the first decades of American fundamentalism. The book quickly rose to prominence, provoking new studies of American fundamentalism and contributing a renewal to the study of fundamentalism in general. The book's timing was fortunate, for it was published as a resurgent fundamentalism was becoming active in American society once again, particularly in American politics. The term fundamentalism was first applied in the 1920s to Protestant movements in the United States that interpreted the Bible in an extreme and literal sense. In the United States, the term fundamentalism was first extended to other religious traditions around the time of the Iranian Revolution in 1978-79. In general, all fundamentalist movements arise when traditional societies are forced to face a kind of social disintegration of their way of life, a loss of personal and group meaning, and the introduction of new customs that lead to a loss of personal and group orientation. Regardless of the tradition to which they belong, all fundamentalists follow certain patterns. Religious ideology is the basis for their personal and communal identity. Religious ideology is the basis for their personal and communal identity. They insist upon one statement of truth that they see as inerrant revealed and unchangeable. They see themselves as part of a cosmic struggle between good and evil. 
They seize on historical moments and reinterpret them in the light of this cosmic struggle. So, uh, famous, well, at least well-known American president can talk about the axis of evil. And another president, the evil empire in the Soviet Union. Fundamentalists demonize their opposition. They are selective in what parts of the religious tradition and heritage they will stress. They are selective. I like to say, tell my students, that fundamentalists basically are heretics, although I don't usually use the word heresy or heretic. Sometimes I've been called a heretic. But a heretic takes one element of the picture, one element of the truth, and says this is the whole story. Fundamentalists take one element of the truth, one part of the tradition, one part of the scriptures, one way of looking at the scriptures, one way of looking at the tradition, and says this is the whole story. Fundamentalist Christianity is defined by Marsden as <clears throat> militantly anti-modernist Protestant evangelicalism. Marsden explains that fundamentalists were evangelical Christians who in the 20th century, quote, militantly opposed both modernism in theology and the cultural changes that modernism endorsed. Militant opposition to modernism was what most clearly set off all fundamentalists. Although we have not usually thought of Roman Catholics as fundamentalists, uh, parenthetically, I am a Roman Catholic historical theologian. Okay. Although we have not usually thought of Roman Catholics as fundamentalists, the term can certainly be applied to a number of contemporary Roman Catholic movements and or organizations, and certainly a large number of today's American Roman Catholic bishops are starting to resemble fundamentalists more and more. That's why I teach in Belgium. If we look at the history of uh, fundamentalism in the United States, there is really a, a five-stage evolution uh, that I'd like to ask you to reflect about now. The earliest phase of fundamentalism in the United States involved articulating what was fundamental to Christianity, what was fundamental to Christianity, and initiating an urgent battle to expel the enemies, excuse me, expel the enemies of Orthodox Protestantism from the ranks of the churches. American Christian fundamentalism, therefore, was a reaction by late 19th and early 20th century evangelical Christians against modernizations in American society such as industrialization, Darwin's theory of evolution, and changes in popular mores. Fundamentalists resented modernization because it clashed with their worldview and their literal interpretations of the Bible and of Christian doctrine. Within the American denominations, fundamentalists fought modernists about the Bible as an historical document, about biblical inspiration, and the biblical explanation for the creation of the world. Fundamentalists also launched a campaign to safeguard authentic Christian values in American society, most notably through laws prohibiting the teaching of evolution in public schools. 
The term fundamentalist was perhaps first used in 1920 by Curtis Lee Laws in the Baptist Watchman Examiner, but it seemed to spring up everywhere in the 1920s as an obvious way to identify someone who believed and active, actively defended the fundamentals of the faith. Throughout the 1920s, fundamentalists waged battles in the large northern church denominations in a struggle for what they perceived as true Christianity at war against a new non-Christian Christianity that they saw uh, was creeping into the churches. In his book, Christianity and Liberation, Christianity and Liberalism, George, Mar uh, George Machen, Presbyterian minister and professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary, called the new naturalistic religion liberalism. But he later followed the more popular fashion of calling it modernism. Church struggles occurred in the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Protestant Episcopal Church, and even in the Southern Presbyterian Church. But the great battles were fought in the Northern Presbyterian and Northern Baptist churches. Machen was the undisputed leader among Presbyterians. Baptists created the National Federation of the Fundamentalists of the Northern Baptists. Uh, American churches like to have all these long titles, huh? like uh, the Second Reformed Third Little Church of Christ on the Hill, um, and someone reforms that, and then it becomes the 32nd Reformed Little Church of Christ on the Big Hill, next to the Little Church of Christ the King. Okay. Anyway, so the Baptists created the National Federation of the Fundamentalists of the Northern Baptists, then the Fundamentalist Fellowship in 1921, the Baptist Bible Union, 1923, to lead the fight. The battles focused on instruction in Baptist seminaries and the formation of missionaries. In many ways, however, the real strongholds of the fundamentalists were the Southern Baptists and a growing number of new independent churches spreading across the, uh, the American South and Midwest. In politics, fundamentalists opposed the teaching of Darwinian evolution in public schools, leading to the famous Scopes trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. William Jennings Bryan, a Presbyterian layman and three times candidate for the American presidency, was the acknowledged leader of the anti-evolution battle. The Scopes trial, informally known as the Scopes Monkey trial, was an American legal case in 1925 in which an American high school biology teacher, John Scopes, was accused of violating Tennessee law because he taught evolution. John Scopes was found guilty but the verdict was overturned because of a technicality and he was never brought back for trial. The trial, however, drew intense national publicity as national reporters flocked to the small town of Dayton to cover the big name lawyers. William Jennings Bryan, three-time presidential candidate, and Clarence Darrow, uh, the famed defense attorney who spoke for Scopes. The trial revealed a growing chasm in American Christianity and two ways of finding truth, one biblical and one scientific. Liberals saw the trial as underlining a growing division in the United States, a division between educated, tolerant Christians and narrow-minded Christians. In contemporary America, the contemporary United States, 
The spirit of the Scopes trial is alive and well in the intelligent design movement. Promoted and greatly funded by the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. The Discovery Institute is the driving force behind the movement and the Institute directs its campaigns through its Center for Science and Culture with guidance from its public relations firm, Creative Response Concepts. The Discovery Institute seeks to promote intelligent design while discrediting evolutionary biology, which the Institute terms Darwinianism. The Institute strongly asserts that teaching evolution leads to eugenics and to Nazism. Intelligent design, a form of creationism, on the other hand, safeguards the belief that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by supernatural intervention, by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection. By the late 1920s, it seemed that militant fundamentalists had failed to expel the modernists from American Protestant Christianity and had lost the battle. Orthodox Protestants, who still numerically dominated all the denominations, now began to struggle among themselves. During the Great Depression, the term fundamentalist gradually shifted meaning as it came to apply to only one party among those who believed the traditional fundamentals of the faith. <coughs> Meanwhile, neo-orthodoxy, associated with Karl Barth's critique of liberalism, found strong adherence in America. During this period, the distinctive theological point made by the fundamentalists was that they represented true Christianity based on a literal interpretation of the Bible and that de facto this ought to be expressed organizationally and clearly distinct from any association with liberals and modernists. In the 1940s, especially after the Second World War, fundamentalists divided gradually into two camps. There were those who continued to use the term fundamentalist to refer to themselves and to equate it with true Bible-believing Christianity. There were others who came to regard the term as undesirable with a connotation of being divisive, intolerant, and anti-intellectual, and not at all concerned about social problems. The term fundamentalist was carried into the 1950s by a vast number of southern and independent churches. It was proudly used by such schools as Bob Jones University, the Moody Bible Institute, the Dallas Theological Seminary, and hundreds of even, even, excuse me, hundreds of evangelists and radio preachers. By the late 1970s, and in particular, by the 1980 U.S. presidential campaign of Ronald Reagan, American fundamentalists entered a new phase. American fundamentalists became nationally prominent as offering an answer for what many regarded as a major social, economic, moral, and religious crisis in the United States. They identified a new and more pervasive enemy secular humanism, which they believed was responsible for the erosion of the churches, the schools, the universities, the government, and above all, families. They fought all enemies which they considered to be subversive supporters of secular humanism, evolutionism, political and theological liberalism, loose personal morality, sexual perversion, socialism, communism, and any lessening of the absolute, literal, and inerrant authority of the Bible. A new generation of television and print fundamentalists arose, notably Jerry Falwell, Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, 
and Pat Robertson. The base for this new fundamentalism was Baptist and Southern, but it reached into all denominations in the North and in the South. Today, the terms Christian right and religious right are often used interchangeably, although the terms are not synonymous. Religious right can refer to any religiously motivated conservative movement, whether specific to one religion or shared across religious lines. The term Christian right is used by people from a wide variety of conservative political and religious viewpoints. Some 15% of the electorate in the United States tell pollsters that they align themselves with the Christian right, which serves as an important voting bloc within the U.S. Republican Party. In presidential elections that put George W. Bush in the White House for eight years, conservative American Catholics joined the Christian right to ensure a Bush victory. Certainly, one can credit this fundamentalist Christian political activism to people like Jerry Falwell and other well-known fundamentalist clergy who began urging American Christians to become involved in politics in the 1970s. By the late 1990s, the Christian right was influencing elections and policy with groups like the Christian Coalition, the Family Research Council, which helped the U.S. Republican Party gain control of the White House, both houses of Congress, and a more conservative Supreme Court in the mid-1990s. The power of the Christian right cannot be overestimated in the most recent midterm elections that have brought a strong voice of opposition to the Democratic Party and to the policies of President Barack Obama. In recent years, Christian right groups have appeared in other countries, such as Canada and the Philippines. However, the Christian right remains an idiosyncratic phenomenon most closely associated with the United States. I'm kind of, <laughs> because of our time limits, I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit. But I'd like to have you really think now about uh, what I call a summary of features common to all fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is fundamentally flawed. Fundamentalism is fundamentally flawed because it takes one element of the truth and proclaims it as the whole truth. Religious fundamentalists place such a high priority on doctrinal conformity and obedience to doctrinaire spokespersons that they sacrifice values basic to the great religious traditions, love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, and caring. In their overwhelming seriousness about religion, fundamentalists do not hesitate to intervene in political and social processes to ensure that society is forced to conform to the values and behaviors of the fundamentalists and the fundamentalist worldview. Fundamentalists are their own justification. Fundamentalism appeals to people for a variety of reasons. For people who feel unimportant or insignificant, fundamentalism says, you are important because you are God's special messenger. For people who are fearful, fundamentalism says, you can't be saved without us, so come join us. For the confused, fundamentalism says, one doesn't have to think about doctrine, nor even be educated in it, just keep quiet and believe. Fundamentalism makes the fundamentalist 
feel good about himself or herself. It is self-stroking. Fundamentalism justifies the hatred of one group of people for another because it believes God hates those who do not conform to the fundamentalist worldview. Fundamentalism appeals to people burdened by guilt and shame because it exempts them from responsibility for situations or actions that cause guilt or shame. Fundamentalism says, if you are one of us, you are okay. Fundamentalism excuses people, excuses people from honest self-examination and justifies their prejudices, zealotry, intolerance, and hatefulness. So, what do we do about fundamentalism? I think the best way to confront ignorance is through real education that emphasizes critical analytical thinking skills. That emphasizes critical analytical thinking skills. I'm a, an older retired professor, but I still teach one university course. And I tell my students at the end of the year, I hope they will have lots of questions, but that they also will have learned the skills of reflecting about their questions and going in search of answers for those questions huh? to develop critical, analytical thinking skills. I think real education teaches students, and we are all students, the importance of gathering evidence, the importance of gathering evidence, and then proceeding to conclusions. Gather evidence, proceed to conclusions. Fundamentalists work in the opposite fashion. We need to establish channels for dialogue channels for dialogue and institutions that promote multicultural knowledge and understanding. At my university in Belgium, I'm in the process, working with some other people, to set up just such a center where we hope to bring Islamic people, Jewish people, Christian people, Catholics, Protestants, uh, Hindus, non-believers, secular humanists, but we hope to set up uh, really a continuing dialogical process with representatives from all these groups to examine the big questions about the human experience, the big questions about human life. Okay. Well, I say we in the West, but it's not just in the West. We need to practice a genuine humility that enables us to see the rest of the world and the rest of the world's needs, a genuine humility. There is no excuse for arrogance, and arrogance can be on both sides in the uh, fundamentalist debate. Hmm? We need to translate our vision gained from humility into concrete and achievable actions and strategies. Well, friends, I think uh, that is about my time limit. But that's our challenge. That's our challenge. Critical thinking skills. Let's go for evidence. Let's not take part of the picture. Let's look to find out the whole picture. And then uh, let's not stand up and walk out of the room but let's stand face to face and talk with each other about it. And if we speak to and with each other about it, let's not speak from some kind of an arrogant posture, but let's realize that we are all in pursuit of the truth. No single one of us has all the answers. So thank you.